بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعند كتاب الفتن Chapter 17 Hadith 2906 From Abu Hurairah the Prophet said لا تقوم الساعة حتى تطلب عليات النساء الدوس حول ذي الخلصة The hour will not be sabish until the backsides of the women of the tribe of Daus circumambulate the Dhul Khalasa. Dhul Khalasa is one of the idols of the Arab. Basically, the shirk is going to reappear in the peninsula. And this is just before the final hour, where there will be no Muslims left because a wind from Yemen is going to take the souls of all the Muslims. Chapter 18, about a man wishing he was dead. Hadith 1573, Rabaya 3. Abu Huraira reports the Prophet said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يمر رجل بقبر رجل فيقول يا ليتني مكانه. The hour will not be established until a man passes by the grave of another and he wishes that was his place. This hadith is not an encouragement to wish for death, but rather it is a khabar, not a hukum, so there's a difference between the two. Khabar is saying what is the case and hukum is saying what ought to be the case. And so this hadith means to tell us of the great fitna before the hour in terms of bloodshed and ideological fitna as well taking you away from your deen. Hadith 2908, Riwayah 1 From Abu Hurairah the Prophet said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِي لَا تَذْهَبُ الدُّنْيَا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمٌ لَا يَدْرِي الْقَاتِلْ فِي مَا قَتَلْ وَلَا الْمَقْتُولْ فِي مَا قُتِلْ فَقِيلَ كَيْفَ يَكُونُ ذَلِكْ قَالَ الْهَرْجْ الْقَاتِلْ وَالْمَقْتُولْ فِي النَّارِ He says by the one who has my soul in his hand, this world will not cease until there comes a time upon a people where the killer will not know why he killed and the killed will not know why he has been killed he was asked how is this and he says al-harj meaning a massacre the killer and the killed will both be in the hellfire so again this narration tells us of the great and widespread massacres that will take place before the hour total bloodshed as for both the killer and the killed being in the fire the killer that's obvious enough as for the killed he was eager to kill the other person of course without due right and we have spoken about this matter when you have the intention and the asbab. Hadith 2909 from Abu Huraira the Prophet said, ذو من الحبشة. A man of two skinny legs from Habasha is going to destroy the Kaaba. And again, this is one of the signs of the hour. Why would the Kaaba be destroyed? Because nobody will be venerating it. As for the people of the field, even the Mushrikun were venerating the Kaaba, so Allah Jalla wa ala protected his house. And the same thing is going to happen with the Qur'an as well. The Qur'an will be removed from this world. Why? Because nobody will be venerating it and acting in accordance with it. It will just be a dead book and the Kaaba will just be a relic of the past, much like how the pyramids are seen nowadays. So it is better for the Kaaba to be destroyed than to be humiliated. Same with the Qur'an. Hadith 29.10 Abu Hurairah reports the Prophet said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يخرج رجل من قحطان يسوق الناس بعصا. The last hour will not come until a man from Qahtan, that's a tribe, will drive the people using his stick. This is another one of the signs of the hour. Al-Qurtubi says that this man is going to be harsh with the people as he drives them with his stick. So he's going to have authority over them. Hadith 29.11 from Abu Huraira. The Prophet said, لا تذهب الأيام والليالي حتى يملك رجل يقال له الجهجاء. The time will not end until a man called Al-Jahaj is going to have power over the people. Al-Qurtubi says maybe this man, Al-Jahja, is the same one from Qahtan mentioned in the previous narration and Allah knows best. We do not know too much about this man in the authentic literature. Hadith 29.12, Rewai number 3, from Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يقاتل المسلمون الترك قوما وجوههم كالمجان المطرقة يلبسون الشعر ويمشون في الشعر the last hour will not come until the Muslims fight at Turk. Their faces will be like a flattened shield. They will wear clothing of hair and walk in shoes of hair. Who are the Turk? These are the Mongols. The Muslimun actually fought the Mongols in the famous battle of Ain Jalut. And the Prophet has ordered us not to fight them until they fight you. The Prophet here is describing their facial features. He's describing people of the East. So from China and the neighboring areas. And this fight had not taken place during the time of the Prophet. So he's giving a prophecy, of course, one of the signs of prophethood. Let's look at Hadith 29.14 of the same chapter. Abu Sa'id al Khudri reports the Prophet said, مِنْ خُلَفَائِكُمْ خَلِيفَةٌ يَحْثُ الْمَالِ حَفْيًا وَلَا يُعُدُّهُ عَدَدًا From amongst the Khulafa, there'll be one who hands wealth out liberally and would not count it. 
Okay, who is this leader spoken of? This leader spoken of appears to be Al-Mahdi. And that will be a time when the wealth will be in abundance. And it is peculiar that the Sahihain do not make mention of Al-Mahdi directly. But they may do indirectly, such as in this narration. Direct mentions of Al-Mahdi are found in the Sunan. For example, in Sunan Abi Dawud, there's a whole chapter dedicated to him. In any case, Al-Mahdi is also one of the signs of Qiyamah. Let's look at Hadith 29.17, Rawaya 1, Abu Huraira reports, the Prophet said, قَدْ مَاتَ كِسْرَ فَلَا كِسْرَ بَعْدَ وَإِذَا هَلَكَ قَيْسَرْ فَلَا قَيْسَرَ بَعْدَ وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ لَتُنْفَقَنَّ كُنُوزُهُمَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ He said, Kisra would die and there will be no Kisra after him. Qaysar, meaning the leader of the room, would die and there will be no Qaysar after him. But the one who has my life in his hand, their treasures would be spent in the way of Allah. So here the Prophet is predicting the demise not only of the rulers of these great empires, but the empire itself. There will be no more Persian Empire and Byzantine Empire, which is exactly what we witness today. So this is another prophecy that has come true. And as for the treasures, well, seeing as though the Muslimin conquered both the Persian and the Byzantine empires, of course their wealth was spent amongst the Mujahideen and fi sabilillah. Because we know that the ghanima is spent amongst the Mujahideen, except for a fifth which is taken out and spent on five different causes. Just a quick linguistic note, the Prophet said, قَدْ مَاتَ Kisra. Kisra has died. Of course, Kisra had not died at the time of the Prophet, but the Prophet is using the past tense to indicate that he will surely die. So the past tense is used as an emphasis for the future. Let's look at Hadith 29:22. Abu Huraira radiAllahu anhu reports the Prophet Sam said, "لا تقوم الساعة حتى يقاتل المسلمون اليهود فيقتلهم المسلمون حتى يختبئ اليهودي من وراء الحجر والشجر فيقول الحجر أو الشجر يا مسلم يا عبد الله هذا يهودي خلفي فتعال فقتل إلا الغرقد فإنه من شجر اليهود." The hour will not be established until the Muslimun fight the Yahud, and the Muslimun will kill them, such that a Yahudi will hide behind a stone or a tree, and that this stone or the tree will say, O Muslim, O Abdullah, there is a Yahudi behind me, so come and kill him, except for the Gharqad tree, because this is the tree of the Yahud. It should not come as a surprise that there will be a fight between the Yahud and the Muslimin, seeing as though there is great political tension between the two parties and it will culminate in a proper fight. And of course Allah Jalla wa ala will grant victory to the Muslimin. But there's a strange piece here, that the tree or the stone will speak, and nearer the end of times, strange things like this will happen. We have just spoken about this beast of the earth speaking to the people, and so trees and stones, for them to be speaking, is something expected nearer the times when unusual occurrences will take place. The Gharqad tree will not help the Muslims because it is a tree of the Yahud. It is a thorny tree found in Asham. Let's take a look at Hadith 157, Rawaya 5. Abu Huraira reports that the Prophet said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يبعث دجالون كذابون قريب من ثلاثين كلهم يزعم أنه رسول الله. The hour will not be established until there emerge 30 great liars, all of them claiming that he is the Messenger of Allah. As for people claiming to be a prophet, this is closer to 30,000 than 30. There are many, many people claiming to be the chosen one, or claiming to be the Mahdi, or claiming to be the prophet, and so on. Many of them are insane. Others perhaps have seen a money-making opportunity, and there could be other reasons as well. But what the Hadith is talking about are great liars, people who are going to have a large following. And the Prophet ﷺ has already told us, that he is the final prophet, as we, for example, saw in the hadith of the Fadail about the man who builds a building except the place of one brick. And the prophet said, I am that brick, that missing piece, to complete the whole building of prophethood. Okay, now let's move to chapter 19, and these are narrations pertaining to Ibn Sayyad, or also known as Ibn Sa'id, who was a boy from the Yahud at the time of the prophet, and he was a soothsayer, and many people of the Sahaba thought that he was a Dajjal spoken of and prophesied, and there was much suspicion surrounding him. He actually embraced Islam after the death of the Prophet, so he's not a Sahabi. So the last that we know of him is that he was a Muslim. 
let us take all the narrations pertaining to him and then we'll speak about any fawaid that we can extract. So Hadith 2924, Abdullah reports. He says we were with the Prophet and we happened to pass by some children amongst whom there was Ibn Sayyad. The children fled but Ibn Sayyad kept seated. The Prophet came up to him and said, Taribat yadak, may your hands become dusty, which is an expression of encouragement. He says, Atashhadu anni Rasulullah, do you testify that I am the Messenger of Allah? Ibn Sayyad replied, La, bal, Tashhadu anni Rasulullah. Ibn Sayyad said, No, but you testify that I am the Messenger of Allah. This is what he said to the Prophet. To which Umar ibn Khattab replied, Let me kill him, O Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet replied, In yakun alladhi tara, falan tastati aqatla. If he is indeed the one whom you suspect, that is, at the Jal, then you will not be able to kill him. Hadith 2924, Riwayah 1. Again, Abdullah is reporting, but in this narration, the Prophet asked him, I have concealed something in my mind, so tell me, what am I thinking of? And Ibn Sayyad replied, Ad-Dukh, to which the Prophet said, Ikhsa, falan ta'adua qadrak, be away with you, you cannot go further than your limits. To which Umar replied, Allow me to strike his neck, O Messenger of Allah. To which the Prophet said, Leave him. If he is the one whom you fear, then you will not be able to kill him. Hadith 29.25 Abu Sa'id reports, The Prophet, along with Abu Bakr and Umar, met Ibn Sayyad on one of the paths of al Madinah. The Prophet asked him, Do you testify that I am the Messenger of Allah? Thereupon he replied, Do you testify that I am the Messenger of Allah? To which the Prophet replied, I have Iman in Allah and his angels and his books. And the Prophet asked him, What do you see? And Ibn Sayyad replied, I see a throne on the water. The Prophet replied, You see the throne of Iblis on the water. What else do you see? He said, I see two truthful people and a liar, or two liars and a truthful person. The Prophet replied, Lubisa alayhi da'uhu. He is confused, leave him. Hadith 29.27 Abu Sa'id al-Khudri replied that we accompanied Ibn Sayyad to Mecca and he said to me, What I have found from the people is that they think I am a Dajjal. But have you not heard the Prophet say that a Dajjal will have no children and yet I have children? And did the Prophet not say that a Dajjal will not enter Mecca or Medina? Abu Sa'id replied, Yes. Ibn Sayyad said, But I was born in al Madina." And now I am entering Mecca. But then he went on to say, But by Allah, I know his birthplace and his abode where he is now. To which Abu Sa'id said, This created confusion in my mind in regard to the identity of Ibn Sayyad. In Riwayah number one, Abu Sa'id said, But would you like to be a Dajjal? To which Ibn Sayyad replied, If I was offered the opportunity, I would not dislike that. In another narration, Rawai number two of this hadith, Ibn Sayyad put his bags next to the bags of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and Abu Sa'id told him to put his bags elsewhere because he did not want to be with Ibn Sayyad. Ibn Sayyad brought some milk to Abu Sa'id and he refused to drink from the hands of Ibn Sayyad because he had so much aversion towards him. Ibn Sayyad caught on and he said that he feels like committing suicide because of what people say about him. And then he gave his reasons as before why he could not be a Dajjal. Abu Sa'id says, I was about to accept his excuses until he said, I know where a Dajjal was born and where he is now. To which Abu Sa'id replied, Tabban lak, may you be destroyed, Sa'ir al yawm for the rest of your day. Hadith 2928 From Abu Sa'id, the Prophet asked Ibn Sa'id about the earth of Jannah. To which he said, O Abu Qasim, it is like fine white musk. To which the Prophet said, You have spoken the truth. Hadith 2929 Muhammad ibn Munkadir reports that I saw Jabir ibn Abdullah taking an oath in the name of Allah that Ibn Sa'id was the Ad-Dajjal. The narrator Muhammad says, I said to him, Do you take an oath in the name of Allah? Thereupon Jabir replied, I heard Umar an taking an oath in the presence of the Prophet to this effect, and the Prophet did not disapprove of it. Hadith 2931 Abdullah ibn Umar 
He says, The Prophet and Ubay bin Ka'ab went towards a palm tree where Ibn Sayyad was. The Prophet hid himself behind one of the palm trees with the intention of overhearing what Ibn Sayyad is saying. He was on a bed with a blanket around him. He was murmuring something. Ibn Sayyad's mother saw the Prophet hiding behind the trunk of the palm tree and she called out to Ibn Sayyad, Awsaf, that was his name, here is Muhammad. Thereupon Ibn Sayyad jumped up and the Prophet said, Lo tarakathu bayyin. If she had left him alone, he would have made things clear. Hadith 169, Rawaya 1. Abdullah ibn Umar reports the Prophet said, standing up amongst the people, praising Allah, mentioning the dajjal He said there is no Prophet who did not warn his people against the dajjal Even Nuh salam warned against him. But I will tell you something which no Prophet has mentioned before to their people. At the dajjal is one-eyed and Allah is not one-eyed. The Prophet also went on to say, إِنَّهُ مَكْتُوبٌ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ كَافِرٌ يَقْرَأُهُ كُلُّ مَنْ كَرِهَ عَمَلَهُ أو يَقْرَأُهُ كُلُّ مُؤْمِنٌ Between his eyes there is written, Kafir. Everyone who hates his deeds will be able to read it. Or he said, all the mu'min will be able to read it. He also says, bear this in mind, that no one will be able to see Allah Jalla wa'ala until he dies. The reason why the Prophet said this is because the dajjal will claim to be Allah. And so the Prophet is saying that you cannot see Allah until you die. So if anyone claims that he is Allah, then this is impossible. Hadith 29.32 Nafi' reports that Ibn Umar met Ibn Sa'id and he said to him a word which enraged him, meaning enraged Ibn Sa'id, and he became swollen with anger until he blocked the whole pathway. Ibn Umar went to his sister Hafsa and informed her about this. Thereupon she said, May Allah have mercy on you. Why did you incite Ibn Sayyad? And you know that the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْ غَضْبَةٍ يَغْضَبُهَا And the Dajjal will only emerge because of some anger. So there we are. These are some of the narrations pertaining to Ibn Sayyad in Sahih Muslim. First of all, let's get the biggest question sorted out. Is Ibn Sayyad Ad Dajjal, meaning the official one whom Isa alayhi salam is going to slay? The answer is no. And we can argue from many angles. Even though there's a difference of opinion and the Muslims of the past have differed, but when you look at the evidence along with rational thinking, the answer is no. Firstly, the hadith of Tamim al-Dari about his ship sailing in the stormy seas, landing on the island of Al-Jassasa, and he sees a Dajjal bound in chains. This narration would close the case completely. How can Ad Dajjal be Ibn Sayyad when Ibn Sayyad is a boy in Al Madina and here is Ad Dajjal chained up on an island? Is Ibn Sayyad then in two places at the same time, looking completely different as well? No sensible person could possibly believe this. Furthermore, the Prophet saw Ad Dajjal in a vision and he says that the man most closely resembling Ad Dajjal is Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan. And Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan is not Ibn Sayyad. And even if somebody says that they reject the hadith of Tamim al-Dari because it is da'if or not trustworthy, even if it is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, we say, okay, let it be da'if for argument's sake. But if you say that Ibn Sayyad is a Dajjal, then you need to furnish us with some positive evidence. And at best what you have is that the companion suspected Ibn Sayyad of being a Dajjal. But the problem is we do not extract our ruling from suspicion. We extract it from clear-cut authentic evidence of which there is none. And if there is none, then the null hypothesis or the status quo is that any given particular person is not a Dajjal. Otherwise anyone can accuse anyone of being the official a Dajjal. Yes, it's true, Ibn Sayyad was a diviner during his days as a Yahudi. And perhaps this is what created the suspicion because Ad Dajjal will perform crazy feats and diviners also can perform some amazing feats. So this may have given rise to the suspicion. But again, our rulings do not come from suspicion. As for Umar ibn al-Khattab taking an oath that he is 
at Dajjal and the Prophet keeping quiet, it is because the Prophet himself did not know. Do you not see how the Prophet told Umar that if he is at Dajjal, you will not be able to kill him? And in a wording it says, if he is not at Dajjal, then there is no goodness in you killing a boy. Also, we see that the Prophet is hiding behind a tree, trying to learn something. What does that tell you? No revelation was given to him. Because the Prophet would not need to hide behind a tree to learn something of Ibn Sayyad, if he has a direct line to Allah Jalla wa'ala with the Wahi. So nothing was given to the Prophet. And if nothing was given to the Prophet, then we resort to the status quo, which is, any given person is not a Dajjal. One might also use the argument that Ibn Sayyad was in Al-Madinah and Makkah and he had children born to him and this is not from the characteristic of a Dajjal. This could be argued back by saying that Ibn Sayyad was not a Dajjal at that time. But when he becomes a Dajjal, then he will not be able to enter Medina or have any children born to him. So that particular argument can be overcome. However, Ibn Sayyad embraced Islam. And for us to then accuse a Muslim of being a Dajjal, then this is the very, very worst type of takfir you can ever make. Not to mention thinking negatively of a Muslim. All of which is not permissible. We see the audacity of Ibn Sayyad in claiming that he is the Messenger of Allah, but he said this as a Yahudi. Why did the Prophet not kill him? Well, it could be that he is a boy, so what's the point of killing a boy and you cannot execute a boy below the age of adolescence? And then besides, the Prophet had a peace treaty with the Yahud. We can take from these narrations that you can go to a diviner and test him to expose him as the Prophet did when he asked him, what am I thinking of? He said, Dukh. The Prophet was thinking of Dukhan, smoke, but Ibn Sayyad said Dukh, so he did not complete the answer, and to which the Prophet rebuked him. So definitely, Ibn Sayyad was a diviner, but not the official Dajjal. If you merely ask a diviner, then 40 days of your Salah are not accepted, and this is a major sin. If you literally believe the diviner, then this is kufr. One might object and say, but we have heard from the hadith of Abu Sa'id al Khudri that Ibn Sayyad had some fondness of Ad Dajjal and that he would not mind being him. We say, yes, that is true, but having a fondness of a kafir does not mean you are that particular kafir. It is wrong to be fond of Ad Dajjal, that is true, but that does not prove you are Ad Dajjal. You need something far more clear cut not an evidence which is ambiguous. Okay, what happened to Ibn Sayyad? In the Sunan of Abi Dawud, we find that Ibn Sayyad was last seen at the Battle of Harra, and he was not seen after that, so we have no knowledge after that event. As for the narration about the two truthful people and one liar, or two liars and one truthful person, then this shak, the doubt, may have been from Ibn Sayyad, or it may have been from one of the narrators. But it makes sense if the confusion was from Ibn Sayyad himself. That's why the Prophet said he is confused. And such is the case with the diviners. It is a case of confusion. Ibn Sayyad says that he knows where Abd Dajjal was born and where he is. He may have known this from his scriptures as a Yahudi, or perhaps the jinn told him from his time as a diviner. And Allah knows best. Some people may argue that when Umar took an oath that Ibn Sayyad is a Dajjal and the Prophet kept quiet, that this is the Prophet acknowledging that Ibn Sayyad is in fact a Dajjal, and as for the Prophet being unsure as to the identity of Ibn Sayyad, such as hiding behind the tree, and such as telling Umar that if he is a Dajjal you will not be able to kill him, then this was before Umar took an oath. So the Prophet was in doubt before Umar took an oath, not afterwards. As afterwards, the Prophet acknowledged the oath of Umar. And so what this opinion seeks to do is that it seeks to create a nasq, an abrogation, to which we reply, okay, bring forth the evidence that one happened after the other. If you do not have evidence of the dates, then we do not resort to nasq. This is one of the established principles of Asul al-Fiqh. Rather, we bring all the evidence together. The bottom line is that it is clear to us that Allah Jalla wa ala did not send down any revelation to the Prophet regarding Ibn Sayyad. Because if he did, then the Prophet would have spoken clearly about him. 
Okay, let's move to chapter 20 about the description of the Dajjal. Hadith 1692, Riwayah 2 from Ibn Umar who says that the Prophet mentioned the Dajjal in front of the people and he said, Inna Allah Ta'ala laysa bi'a'war ala wa inna al-Masih al-Dajjal a'war al-Ayn al-Yumna ka'anna aynahu aynabatun tafi'a Allah Ta'ala is not one-eyed and al-Dajjal is blind on the right eye as if his eye is like a extinguished grape. Ad-Dajjal is going to claim to be Allah Jalla wa'ala himself. And so the Prophet is telling us that Allah is not one-eyed. He's giving us a physical attribute of Allah Jalla wa'ala in that he's not one-eyed and Ad-Dajjal is one-eyed. One might ask, is it not possible to intellectually know that Ad-Dajjal cannot be Allah Jalla wa'ala? How can Allah be a human in the flesh? This is nonsense. Well, actually, this hints to how powerful the fitna of Ad-Dajjal will be in that many people will believe that he is in fact Allah. It will completely bamboozle their intellect such that they will not be able to rationally conclude that a man in the flesh cannot be Allah Jalla wa'ala. So just imagine how powerful this fitna would be. This is why the Prophet gives us physical signs, not rational ones, but physical signs such as the word kafir written on his forehead and such as the one eye. From this hadith, some scholars such as Ibn Uthaymeen conclude that Allah Jalla wa'ala has two eyes precisely. As for the Qur'an, it talks about one eye. وَلِتُسْنَعَ ala aini, That's one eye. He also talks about تَجْرِيبِ أَعْيُنِنَا A'yun is plural. Plural is more than one, but no number is given. This hadith, they say, indicates strongly to two eyes. Now why would they say that? The argument they give is that having more than two eyes would be better and it is not for the Prophet to restrict himself to the inferior when he could have mentioned the superior. All the Prophet says is that Allah is not one-eyed. The alternative to that is two-eyed. But one might say, well, it could be three-eyed or four or five or there is no upper limit really. And we say, but the fact that the Prophet does not give the extra eyes, three, four, five, and so on, and he has restricted himself to not one-eyed, enables us to conclude that he is two-eyed, because the Prophet would not restrict himself to the inferior when he could have mentioned the superior. So if Allah was three-eyed, the Prophet ought to have said that Ad-Dajjal is one-eyed, but Allah is three-eyed, and so on. But he simply restricts himself to not one-eyed, so the alternative to conclude is that he is two-eyed and Allah knows best. Okay, we have learned that even Nuh السلام, warned his people of the dajjal Why would he need to do that when his people are in no danger of the dajjal The Prophet's Ummah is in danger of the dajjal And the answer that can be given is that firstly, is due to the great danger of the dajjal and how much fitna he's going to spread in the land. Another answer that can be given is that those prophets did not know when Ad-Dajjal is going to appear. As for what is written on his forehead, it could be the word Kafir fully written or it could be the root letters Ka, Fa and Ra. Both are possible and Allah knows best but the point is that the Mu'min will be able to read it and the Kuffar will not be. And regardless of whether they know Arabic or not because the Hadith is general, it says Kullu mu'min, every mu'min will be able to read it. Also it should be noted that in other narrations it says that his left eye will be a'war, so he cannot see from that. It appears that both of his eyes are going to be defective, but in different ways. Hadith 2933, Anas ibn Malik reports that the Prophet said, مَا مِن نَبِيٍ إِلَّا وَقَدْ أَنْذَرَ أُمَّتَهُ الْأَعْوَرَ الْكَذَّابِ أَلَا إِنَّهُ أَعْوَرْ وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَرْ وَمَكْتُوبٌ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ Kafara. Every prophet has warned his nation of the one-eyed liar. Behold, he is one-eyed, and your Rabb is not one-eyed. On his forehead are the letters Kafara. Also, we have Hadith 2934. Hudayfa reports the prophet said, Ad-Dajjal a'warul ayn al-yusra. Jufal al-sha'ar. Ma'ahu jannatun wa nar. Fanaruhu janna wa jannatuhu nar. The Dajjal is blind of the left eye with much hair and there would be a garden and a fire with him. His fire would be the garden and his garden would be the fire. So in this narration, 
he is defective in the left eye. We say he is blind in the left eye, and in his right eye, as in the previous narration, it's like an extinguished grape, or in some other narrations, a floating grape. So he can see from the right eye, which looks like a floating grape or an extinguished grape, and he cannot see from the left eye. Some scholars say that the right eye will be like an extinguished grape, and the left eye would be floating, that would be tafia. As for the Jannah and the Nar, then if one has to choose to enter, then let him choose the fire, for his fire will be a cool garden, and his cool garden will actually be the fire, because Ad-Dajjal means the great deceiver, and he's going to deceive people, and this Jannah and Nar is just one of the ways in which he will deceive. So if you disbelieve in him, he will throw you into his fire, but his fire will turn out to be a Jannah. Hadith 2934, Riwayah 3 Uqba ibn Amir, Abu Mas'ud al-Ansari reports, I went to Hudhayfa ibn al-Yaman and said to him, Narrate what you have heard from the Prophet pertaining to Ad-Dajjal. He said that the Prophet said, Ad-Dajjal would appear and with him would be water and fire. What the people see as water would be, in fact, the fire that would burn. And what people would see as the fire would in fact be water and any one of you who should witness this should plunge into that which he sees as the fire for it would be sweet and pure water Uqba said yes i also heard this hadith so this narration complements the previous one let's take the last narration of, of an nawas ibn sam'an this is narration 2937 he says that the prophet mentioned at the jal one day he would sometimes describe him as insignificant and other times describe him as significant. So much so that we felt that Ad-Dajjal is amongst us, amongst the date palm trees. One evening the Prophet saw us with fear on our faces. He said, what is the matter with you? We said, O Messenger of Allah, you mentioned Ad-Dajjal in the morning, sometimes describing him to be insignificant and other times as extremely significant. Until we began to think that he were present in some near part of the cluster of the date palm trees. Thereupon, the Prophet said, I fear other things besides at dajjal for you. If he comes, and I am among you, then I shall contend with him on your behalf. But if he comes forth while I am not amongst you, every man must contend on his own behalf, and Allah will take care of every Muslim on my behalf. The Prophet goes on to say, that he is a young man with curly hair. His eye is extinguished. I compare him most to Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan. And this person was a kafir. He amongst you who survives to see him should recite over him the opening ayat of Surah Al-Kahf. He would appear on the way between Iraq and Asham, And left and right he would spread corruption. O servants of Allah, so remain firm. We asked how long will he be on the earth and the Prophet replied 40 days. One of these days would be like a year, the other like a month, the other like a week and the rest of the days will be like normal days. We asked, O Messenger of Allah, would one day's prayer suffice for the prayers equal to one year? Thereupon he said, no, but you must make an estimate of time. We asked, O Messenger of Allah, how quickly will he travel in the earth? And the Prophet replied, like a cloud driven by the wind. He would come to a people and invite them to believe in him. They will believe in him. And he will give a command to the sky and it will rain. And the earth will grow crops. And in the evening their pasturing animals would come to them with their humps high and their udders full of milk and their bellies outstretched from food. And then he will come to another people and invite them. But they would reject him. And he would go away from them. And there would be drought for such people and nothing would be left with them in the form of wealth. He would then walk forth in a wasteland, and he will command the land to bring forth your treasures. And from this seemingly useless wasteland, there would come forth treasures, like a swarm of bees. He would then call a youthful man, and strike him with the sword, and cut him into two pieces, and put the two pieces apart. Then he would call the two pieces, and he will come forward laughing with his face gleaming, meaning the two pieces are going to come together and form 
this man again. So when a Dajjal is like this, causing corruption in the land and fitna, Allah Jalla wa'ala will send Isa ibn Maryam. He will descend at the white minaret in the eastern side of Damascus, wearing two garments lightly dyed with saffron and placing his hands on the wings of two angels. When he would lower his head, there would fall beads of perspiration from his head. And when he would raise it up, beads like pearls would scatter from it. Every kafir who would smell the fragrance of Isa would die and the breath of Isa would reach as far as he would be able to see. Then he would search for a Dajjal and he would catch hold of him at the gate of Lud and would kill him. Then some people whom Allah had protected would come to Isa ibn Maryam and Isa would wipe their faces and would inform them of their ranks in Jannah. And it would be under such conditions that Allah would reveal to Isa alayhi salam that I have brought forth from amongst my servants such people against whom none would be able to resist. So you must take your people safely to Mount Tur. Then Allah Jalla wa'ala will send Ya'juj and Ma'juj and they would swarm down from every high place. The first of them would pass by the lake of Tiberias and this is a lake in Jordan and they would drink out of it. When the latter part of this tribe would come to the lake Tiberias they would find no water because it would all have been drunk. They would say there used to be water in this river. Isa and his companions will find life tough on Mount Thor such that a head of an ox would be dearer to them than 100 dinar. Isa Islam and his companions would make dua to Allah who would send against Ya'juj and Ma'juj insects which would appear on their necks and in the morning the Ya'juj and Ma'juj would perish like a single person. Then Isa Islam and his companions would come down and they would not find on the earth as much as a space for a single handspan which would not be filled with the putrefaction and stench of the Ya'juj and Ma'juj. They would make dua to Allah again, who will send birds whose necks would be like those of camels, and they would carry the corpses and throw them where Allah wills. Then Allah will send rain, which no house of clay or the tent of camel hairs would keep out, and it would wash away the earth until it would appear like a mirror, so so clean and clear. Then the earth would be told to bring forth its fruit and restore its blessings. And as a result thereof, there would grow such a big pomegranate that a group of people would be able to eat it and seek shelter under its skin. And the milch cow would give so much milk that a whole party of people would be able to drink from it. And the milch camel would give such a large quantity of milk that the whole tribe would be able to drink out of it and that the milk sheep would give so much milk that the whole family would be able to drink out of that. Allah will send a pleasant wind which would strike the armpits of people and it will take the soul of every mu'min and there will only remain the most evil types of people who would commit adultery like donkeys and it is upon them that the last hour will be established. You notice from this narration that sometimes the Prophet would speak seriously about the dajjal and other times not so. And perhaps the wisdom behind this is that he's saying that the fitna of the dajjal will be immensely serious but not so serious that you cannot handle it. That's why sometimes he would belittle the dajjal Otherwise people might just fall into despair. We are told to contend for ourselves against Ad-Dajjal and we are told to recite the opening ayat of Surah Al-Kahf. Some narrations say the opening 10 ayat. Other narrations speak about the last 10 ayat. Some narrations even say 3 ayat from the beginning. And all of this can be practiced. So in this there is the Fadila of Surah Al-Kahf which should be recited every Friday. And the whole week will be enlightened for you with guidance as has been mentioned in the authentic narration in the Sunan. We learn something of the description of Ad-Dajjal which has preceded. He is likened to Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan 
So note that this is not Ibn Sayyad. Ibn Qatan died in the Jahiliya times as a kafir. So that this is not backbiting because we're talking about a kafir who is not a dhimmi. We learn where a dajjal will appear in an area between Iraq and Asham. And we know that he's going to be killed in the gate of Lud, which is in Palestine. The interesting point about the 40 days, if one day is going to be like a year, the Prophet is saying you do not pray five prayers in that day. So that these five prayers are going to be immensely stretched out. No, you estimate when the next prayer would be. So if the time between Fajr and Dhuhr is, let's say, seven hours, then you estimate how long seven hours would be. And like this with the other salawat as well. It's all done via estimation. You cannot rely on the sun in this circumstance because you will find no help with the shade of the sun. However, nowadays, if a person is living near the poles and he does not have a usual day-night cycle, then he prays in accordance with the closest land which has a usual 24-hour day-night cycle. And this applies to fasting as well. It's also interesting how the Sahaba ask about the Salah, which is the most important act of all the Islamic affairs. And they do not ask about how can a day be like one year. They know that during the end of times, the situation is going to be strange. These will not be normal times. And we also learn of the great fitna. Those who believe in Ad-Dajjal will have much wealth, rain, crops, even fat animals, exactly the things which people want. And as for those who reject him, they will be deprived of their wealth. So this will be an examination. Who chooses the deen over the dunya? We find nowadays people are failing this fitna. They are choosing the dunya over the deen, even nowadays with this petty dunya. So how would it be in the times of Ad-Dajjal when the fitna will be ever the more magnified? Allahu musta'an. We also learn of the fitna of him chopping a boy in half and yet bringing him back to life. And all of this is going to entice people to worship him and take him as a god because this will be his claim. We also learn of the majestic description of Isa alayhi salam and how he will descend and how his hair is going to be trickling down with water like pearls with his hands on angels. It is an awe-inspiring description. We find also the fadila of Damascus and Asham in general where he will descend. Some have said he will descend in Beit al-Maqdis and Allah knows best. Isa alayhi salam will not descend as a prophet, mind you. He will descend as a follower of the last prophet and the follower of our sharia. And we find his immense effect that even his breath will kill off the kuffar. As for the true tribes of Ya'juj and Ma'juj mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, then some say this word is Arabic, others say it is not. There is an Arabic word, Ta'ajjaja, which means when a flame erratically burns. And so these two tribes of Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be just as erratic as a burning flame and Allah knows best but the point is that they will be so strong no one will be able to resist them and so if the case is like this we are allowed to flee from the enemy if they are so overwhelming however if the ratio is two to one in their favor then the Muslims are commanded to stand and fight and we learn of the difficult life at At-Tur and how Isa alayhi salam and his companions at that time are going to have full tawakkul on Allah Jalla wa ala. So in this, there is a lesson on having tawakkul on Allah during times of difficulty and indeed during all times. We also learn about how Allah Jalla wa ala will suffice the Muslimin from Ya'juj and Ma'juj by killing them off and cleansing the earth from their rotting corpses. All of the Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be kuffar. They will wipe out anyone on earth and their arrogance would be such that it is mentioned that they would say that we have wiped out everyone on earth and now let us wipe out everyone in the heavens and they will fire their arrows upwards towards the sky and their arrows will return bloodied. Allah al -musta'an. These birds mentioned are clearly strange birds and Allah knows best about them. And then after that we learn of some good news about how wealth will grow in abundance, how people can take shade under the skin of a pomegranate which is absolutely incredible. But this is an indication of the barakah of Allah Jalla wa'ala. 
We also learn the mercy of Allah Jalla wa'ala in that he will kill off the mu'mineen and then save them from the trumpet of Yawm al-Qiyamah and the horrors therein. This is actually a mercy. And we also learn that Yawm al-Qiyamah will be established upon the most evil types of people with no shred of Iman in their heart. We know that Yawm al-Qiyamah will be established when even the word Allah is not uttered. It is better to not witness such people. Okay, at this stage, let's take some review questions. So, question number one. Describe the eyes of a dajjal Question number two. Why would Allah Jalla wa'ala allow the Kaaba to be destroyed? Question number three. What is the mode of protection against a dajjal which the Prophet advised us 